Uh, greetings, folks, to what is very likely the oddest or strangest first day of the Feast of Tabernacles uh, in the modern era. But I want to say along with that, happy Sabbath. It's a holy day, and it's the weekly Sabbath, so I want to welcome you to Shepherd's Voice in the name of Jesus Christ. And we, we thank you for taking part in uh, watching these videos. I say it's likely the strangest first day of the Feast of Tabernacles uh, period because typically by now a great number of us would be in transit or have already had already arrived at uh, various feast sites uh, oftentimes in a different city uh, but even if you stay in your own uh, city as we did last year here in Calgary when we hosted the Feast of Tabernacles this is the high point of the festival cycle and the feast cycle, holy day cycle that Jesus Christ is pictured in. And this, is, this really is kind of the, the goal throughout the year to get to, isn't it? We, we've often, uh, I'm sure, felt like that uh, for most of us anyways in the Sabbath keeping community. But of course, for reasons of uh, the pandemic, travel restrictions and the like, uh, this year is, is unique. Because unlike past years, uh, we won't be offering services every single day of the feast. Uh, we'll be doing it just on this, the first day, and on the last day. Uh, and oddly enough, uh, those days fall out on the weekly Sabbath this year. So it's got a certain convenience built into it. And as you know, we have suspended live services here in Calgary uh, since mid-March. Uh, late March uh, of early 2020 and that being the case we've arrived we've arrived through an entire festival cycle of online services and doing things very differently in past years we have arrived at the Feast of Tabernacles now throughout this year we've been championing at pretty much every opportunity uh, the idea that despite the limitations and disappointments and so forth that are brought about by the reaction to the pandemic, uh, God has actually provided us with an opportunity to become more in tune and more keenly aware of our faith. And being as this is the high point, kind of the pinnacle of the Holy Day season, I think that it's beneficial for us to bear that in mind. And you might be saying, oh boy, here he goes again. And guess what? You'd be right. I put on my red shirt, comb my hair. So I'm going to do what I do here. See, it's because of this entire Holy Day cycle that we've had no other choice but to operate on faith, brethren. And you can probably tell by the grin on my face that I actually believe, I truly believe that this, this is a good thing. But our weekly routines have been altered. Our holy day routines have been altered. We haven't sung hymns together. We haven't had coffee together. We haven't stood in the doorway on the way out of church as we're wont to do, chatting and chatting. I guess I'm the guilty party for that. I do that a lot. Um, but we haven't done that in some time. A lot of our tradition that we have, and I'm not using uh, tradition as a, as a pejorative in this, in this instance. Uh, it's good that we have these things, these social interactions, these uh, points of fellowship that we have, and, and they are important. And God willing, we will get back to it uh, at, at some point. But it's given us all a chance to engage a little bit in some self-discipline. I, I would definitely throw that out there with regard to our Bible study and our general church practice, if you will. There are church habits, uh, if you'll allow me to put it that way. I mentioned uh, a, few week, a few weeks back uh, that our online attendance, our church attendance week to week, uh, that has been coming in through these uh, YouTube premiere messages that, that we've been doing, well, it's been as steady and as consistent as it's ever been. And I find that absolutely remarkable. Uh, but, but of course, there is a certain convenience, again, built into the fact that we can uh, tune in at a certain time 
Uh, it's much easier to go online. You know, it's just physically easier for a lot of people, and and that's okay. And we will continue to put up Sabbath messages, whether or not we get back to live services anytime soon. We'll continue to put uh, premier messages up on on the Sabbath because I, I believe it is important uh, for those who simply can't make it to church. Um, but thank God for this, folks. We've had great consistency over the year, over this uh, whole year. You know, we don't have a tremendously high viewership uh, by YouTube standards. Let's put it that way. Uh, however, when Jim and I get out here every week and the other speakers uh, that we, we hope to bring up periodically, uh, we're speaking usually to more than double the amount of people that are in our respective areas. Uh, and triple in some cases when you think of uh, Penticton, where uh, Alex Kennedy and uh, my mom Janice are, and out in Winnipeg, uh, where the, the Independent Church of God Winnipeg kind of comes out of Winnipeg. And we have a ministry here in Calgary, and we've hitched our wagon with the, the Shepherd's Voice. Uh, so some of those areas, it's almost... You know, it's triple or four times, you know, when we, you look at the numbers of people that are viewing this. And I just can't stress enough how much I think we ought to thank God for, for that kind of consistency. People are actually hearing and they're, they're taking an interest in what, what we have to say here. So it's not all bad. It's not all bad. And it can't be bad. We're headed into the feast, right? It can't be that bad. In fact, the challenge has been, I believe, uh, a positive thing the, in, in this respect, in this respect. Uh, trust me, I'm no fan of how we got here due to this COVID-19 uh, situation. However, I'll start today's message kind of uh, proper here by noting two things that we might find interesting. And, ho and hopefully you do. I'll try not to keep you here too long today. It's not a, unheard of, biblically speaking, to embark on a journey of faith or to be currently in a journey of faith or even to have reached the destination and very soon be met with adversity. It's just not unheard of. And we'll read about that in just a moment. And the second thing would be that we are temporary beings. We are temporary, living in a temporary tent, as Paul put it. Uh, and we'll also read about that shortly. And this period of time, whether or not our lives or our church habits and so forth return to what we would consider normal or return to things that we're comfortable with, it's indeed temporary. It is temporary. It may seem like it's going on, it's dragging on, you know, like a sermon from old Pastor Redshirt. Uh, you know, it goes on and on and on. But it's not. It, it is actually temporary. So let's begin by taking a quick look at one example for the first point. And we're only going to go through a, a little bit today because I'm going to give you some scriptures that I want you to read on your own. You know, part of that self-discipline and Bible study that we need to embark on. Um, but let's take a look at one example for the fo first point. Uh, in that it's not unheard of to meet with adversity and challenges while on our journey of faith. Turn with me, if you will. Genesis 12. That's over uh, near the beginning of the book. Genesis 12. Let's have a, have a look at that, and we'll read the first handful of verses there in Genesis 12. Uh, verse 1 says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house, and the land to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Drop down to verse 4. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seven, 75 years old when he left Haran. Uh, drop down to verse 8, if you would. Uh, from there he moved on to the hill country, east of Bethel, and pitched his tent put my finger up that's that that's the that's the finger of ah there's something we should be remembering here let's keep our mind on the fact that he pitched his tent 
with Bethel on the west and I on the east, he built an altar to the Lord there, and he called on the name of the Lord. And in verse 9 it says, Then Abram journeyed by stages to Negev. So we see here this little trajectory happening. God calls him, he responds, he goes out. This is where he went out on faith. All right. But then we see in the very next verse, after verse 9, the journey in stages, by stages to the Negev. The very next verse, once Abraham had made the choice to pull up stakes and go as God had directed him, the sight of the, de you know, sight unseen, he didn't know what the destination was, just that God told him, I'm going to show you where to go. And he faithfully travels through various regions. And he finally makes it to Canaan, to the land of Canaan. What happens, the very next verse, verse 10, there was a famine in the land. There was a famine. So Abram went down to Egypt to stay there for a while because this wasn't just any old famine. The famine in the land was severe. The famine in the land was severe. So the following verses of this passage uh, then tell of uh, his transition into, into Egypt, and you can read all of that on your own. But if we do draw back just a little bit and take a look at what's going on here, we should be able to take note of a couple of things. You see, back in verse 8, he moved into the hill country, and as I said, interestingly enough, he pitched a tent, a temporary place to stay while gradually making his way to the Negev. Once there, I would assume some time elapsed. It doesn't say much about just exactly how, how much time. But the next thing the inspired text records for us is that this severe famine, hardship, starvation, discomfort, likely death, I'm sure of it, and all that goes with that appears to have shown up. So, we don't, as I said, we don't see a whole lot of what transpired on the in-between of him getting you know, after leaving his tent and moving to the Negev, suddenly there's, there's this famine that's mentioned. I think that's interesting that we should note. See, he stayed somewhere temporarily, and, and while there, still operating on faith, he experienced adversity, and he had to act. He had to act. Because my assumption is that the first thing on Abraham's mind uh, and his family's mind was not a trip to Can out of Canaan after they'd first arrived, just to turn around and pack up and head to Egypt. It doesn't seem to me that that would be the case. So something happened along the way wherein things changed. Things changed. In Abram's case, for the worst, with this severe famine. And a major adjustment had to be made. Major adjustment had to be made. The point being also that Abram was acting on faith irrespective of the situation. It didn't matter what was happening. In his perspective, it was looking to what God wanted. And he had to change his direction sometimes. He had to, there was a flexibility there. So my hope is that, God willing, we can make the correlation between this lesson back in Genesis and our current situation, and especially as we begin the Feast of Tabernacles this year. See, although the feast indeed does picture a time when there will be true personal security, security in Jesus Christ, and a time when there is an end for a thousand years to things like pandemics and severe famine. There will be an end to that. But folks, we haven't reached that yet. To use a, an Abrahamic term, we haven't reached Canaan yet. We're still in the hill country. We are still in a tent. We're still in a tent. 
our very existence, our very existence is a temporary dwelling. And again, I'd say, praise God. See, I believe this is so important for the 21st century believer in Christ. All these years later, in a different part of the world, this is one of the blessings I see during this time that we're all experiencing. Notice I didn't say we're in this together. I'm really getting tired of hearing that from our politicians and news people. We're all in this together. Uh, I guess so, eh? I'll stick with being together with Christ through it. I think that's a, a better bet, folks. I really do. Many of us have heard many, many messages about how we at the, uh, about what we do at the feast uh, and in what we would call normal conditions, uh, that this is a time to travel and stay in temporary dwellings. We've heard tons of messages about this and there are certain ministers that are really hard on this that, you know, you absolutely, don't go near your house. Don't go near your house, you know, during the feast because it's against God and you'll die or something. I don't know what their point is. But under those uh, normal conditions, you know, in the feast, we've kind of taken and made a facsimile, a reasonable facsimile of what we think kind of happened in uh, Israel's time, and we've kind of transposed it onto the modern era. And I think to a large degree, uh, we, we've maybe lost sight of what the actual focus ought to be and what the what the meaning is and we put so much on uh putting out all kinds of money and staying places not and not that that's a bad thing necessarily but it does make it tough for folks that that aren't able to do so and i've been that person a number of times where you know things happen in life and you you just can't uh, can't make it. it it's it's hard to uh it's hard to prepare sometimes for the things that come up in our lives but understand that I don't necessarily think that, that we have to stay in elaborate hotels all the time and do all this kind of thing to show God that we recognize that we are in a temporary place. I, I don't think that we have to do that necessarily. See, Israel and modern Judaism also recognizes the feast and they do so in commemoration in part of their temporary stay in Egypt and for the festival period they many stay in a traditional Sukkot and especially in Israel I'm sure you'd see this a lot and that's fine but I think that we are in a temporary dwelling as it is I believe that. We are in a temporary dwelling as it is. So maybe it's time that we kind of have a look at these things and we say, okay, well, it's all nice, and if we're able to do it, that's great. But we are in this temporary dwelling, and I think we need to really start focusing a bit more, more inward, inwardly, actually. Uh, so even if we do at some point return to a more traditional feast experience, and I'm certain that, that we will to some degree, um, you know, Abram, for a couple of reasons, left Egypt and went back to the Negev. Perhaps, similarly, we're going to go back to what we think is kind of a normal uh, experience at the feast. Uh, but I believe that there is something to be gained from our really taking a look at our already temporary state. I think it would be beneficial. We are temporarily here with the indwelling of Jesus Christ ahead of a time when we are going to be able to dwell openly together with Jesus Christ. And that is a time to look forward to and a time pictured by the Feast of Tabernacles. So that's the first thing. We can be, we can be assured biblically that a life given over to faith a life lived in faith is also going to experience trials and difficulty this time around. This time around, brethren. 
Turn with me, if you will, to the to Second Corinthians and chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. And we're going to have a look at what Paul had to say about our temporary state. Let's begin in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 5. It says, For we know that our earthly tent that we live in, if it, our earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal dwelling in the heavens not made with hands. Verse 2. Indeed, we groan in this tent, again, tent, tabernacle. Your translation might say tabernacle, same, same thing in this, in this instance. Desiring to put on our heavenly dwelling. In verse 3, since when we are clothed, we will still not be found naked. Indeed, we groan while we are in, what? This tent, this tent. Burdened as we are, because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed, so that mortality may be swallowed up by life. And who is life, brethren? Jesus Christ is life. Verse 5, now the one who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a down payment. And isn't that interesting? That he gave us a down payment on his promise to, promise to us. That's amazing to me, brother. He gave us the spirit as a down payment. And in verse 6, so we are always confident and know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. So here's one we should have all committed to our memories at this point. Read with me in verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. We should always have that one uh, in our minds. But notice how many times Paul mentioned tents while referring to our temporary state. I hope you noticed that. See, Acts 18 uh, verses 1 to 3. This talks about when Paul met Aquila uh, in, in his city and that Paul was a tradesman of the, uh, of the same uh, trade. It, and that was that he was, a, among his other callings, of course, uh, that he was a tent maker. And you can read that all for yourself. Again, that's Acts 18, 1 to 3. You can read that in the entire uh, chapter of Acts. Uh, um, let me say this, that I don't believe that it's at all a stretch that God used somebody to be so influential upon us and upon all who were reading him and hearing him regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ and his kingdom, it's, it's, uh, to me it's not a stretch at all that he used someone such as Paul who was so keenly aware uh, and educated in the making and the repairing and the maintenance of temporary dwellings. I think that it's incredibly interesting that that is the case. And that we have been directed by Jesus Christ to look at these and ingest these apostolic writings about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But somebody that was so keenly aware of, especially the maintenance and the repair, you know, of, of temporary dwellings. So Abraham stayed in a tent, and Paul had tents on his mind for the purpose of our instruction. Now, Abraham didn't know Paul, but Paul knew a lot about Abraham. So let's carry on with the theme. And we'll have a look at what Paul said to the folks at the church at Rome about Abraham. Interesting stuff again here. Turn with me now to Romans 4. Romans 4 and in verse 3. says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. 
That is huge, brethren. That's huge. See, a further study of Romans uh, 4, especially between uh, verses 9 to 12, reveals that this belief and faith in God was credited to Abraham as righteousness prior to his circumcision. Prior to his circumcision, so as to give access to that same righteousness to those who would believe, yet were uncircumcised. And that's a verse 11 says, this was to make him the father of all who believe, but are not circumcised, so that righteousness may be credited to them also. That means it's available to you and I, brethren. Thank God for that. Happy feast. Now, when circumcision is used in this context, it's referring when we're talking about those who were not circumcised, the Gentile people. And this is important because it speaks to and about you and about this guy right here. Has two thumbs and looks like me. This is available to us, brethren. And the point being is because Abraham was faithful and he responded when God called, rewarded and tested him in all those aspects. And Paul was aware of this, and this is the kind of mindset that he was trying to get across to those who were hearing him then and to the people who would read of him now. All this, and we didn't even speak about the whole Isaac situation and the faith that that took for Abraham and for Isaac to embark on that journey. We haven't even talked about that. This says that well before any of this, before Abraham was even circumcised, that this righteousness was credited to him so that it would be available to us. And Paul makes note of that for a reason. Not to make us British Israel or anything foolish like that, but to recognize the blessing that came through Abraham, which was Jesus Christ, which gives us this opportunity for righteousness, brethren. It's fascinating. Fascinating to me. I don't, I, I don't know how anybody couldn't think that it, that it was. It's absolutely fascinating. It's that type of faith. It's that kind of attitude and mindset and heart that... God credited to Abraham as righteousness, brethren. Similarly, through that same belief, through that same response and ultimate growth and spiritual maturity in Christ that we've been talking about recently in Colossians 1, we have the opportunity to come out of our earthly tent and meet with that permanent dwelling place, which is going to be this new recreation of everything that, that Jesus Christ puts in, in motion. And don't think that it's not already in motion. This isn't the coming kingdom of God. That, that millennium is an aspect of it. That kingdom is supposed to be living and being a, a huge part of us now, brethren. And we have the opportunity to live like it. And especially right now during the Feast of Tabernacles, which I hope you all are going to enjoy this year. Brethren, we exist in this tent or this tabernacle in this temporary phase of this earth in God's plan. And I believe that God is, and I mentioned this on atonement, calling us to respond in faith during this time of social unrest and restricted travel, the trial that is right now, brethren. He's, calling, he's still calling us to respond. So please don't let the discomfort or the fear of not observing in a typical fashion uh, or a traditional way the, the, that we're used to for this year, you know, uh, or, or being in uncharted territory, as it were, for the feast or for any of God's holy days and Sabbaths. Don't let it hold you back from expressing your faith, brethren. Your faith in Him. And to do it in the best way you can, given the situation that you're in. 
Because truly, brethren, that's what God is asking for. And the biblical accounts show that this has been the case for the most influential and spirit-led individuals that God has used to get through to us, to work its way into the gray matter up here and to our hearts, brethren. And this is where we get around to what the title of the message is, you see, because while we may be in uncharted territory, brethren, we are in good company, clearly. First and foremost, we have Jesus Christ, and we have these examples that we can turn to. We are in good company, in uncharted territory, brethren. So with that, I'm not going to keep you any longer. Please, if possible, stay in touch with each other. Utilize the technology that is there. People are getting together on Zoom and Skype. And uh, if you're a Gmail subscriber, there is now a video meeting that you can, you can do with that. There's always the phone. And if you can meet, do so. Do so. Be careful. Follow the restrictions in the jurisdiction that you're in. But do try to come together somehow. Lift each other up in prayer. Lift each other up in faith. Lift each other up in thanksgiving. Our time here, both the good and the difficult, is temporary, folks. However, the millennial period that this feast represents, and that this Sabbath because the weekly Sabbath does actually uh, represent a mini feast, if you, you think about it in, the, in those terms. This sets the stage for what God has in mind to institute for eternity. This thousand year period that this picture sets in motion those stages that are going to take us into eternity with Jesus Christ once that millennial period is over. This is a magnificent time. Don't let anything stifle your faith brethren and God willing each one of us will be there to share in that righteousness so happy Feast of Tabernacles everyone hit the bell give us the thumbs up please tell a friend and brethren we'll see you next time on Shepherd's Voice magazine